Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Finance Initiative's monthly seminar. I'm Alicia Seiger. I'm the Managing Director of the Sustainable Finance Initiative and the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance and a lecturer at the law school. Before we get started, I want to thank Katie Taflin, who is our program manager who runs these seminars. Uh, and, and without her, we, we wouldn't be here. Uh, also want to be thanking So Young In, who uh, is a research fellow at SFI, who's recently taken a new post in Korea. Um, she will continue to manage the seminar uh, for the next winter and spring quarters, just couldn't be here today. Um, I'm really excited to share this content with you. I really wish we were in a room together. Um, I know many of you, I know we'd have a rich conversation uh, in person, gonna do the best we can uh, with slides here in a virtual setting and, uh, and then leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, I also wanna just here note um, our research team. So this work is a team effort and Mark Roston Professor Tom Heller and Abigail Matheson, who's a recent uh, GSB EIPER graduate, have been the team that's, that's been pulling all this together. So we're gonna do a lot today, but um, I'm excited about this presentation. You can give me feedback at the end, but I think we've organized this information in a way to hopefully make it as easy for you to digest as possible, because we're gonna cover a lot of ground. Uh, we're gonna cover the research, the sustainability at Stanford just briefly and SFI's broader research agenda just to put this work in context. We're gonna cover the current state of practice, which we call counting carbon uh, and, and including sort of how the story of how we got here. And then we're gonna kind of turn the prism of practice a little bit to see a better path forward, which we call carbon accounting. People throw carbon accounting as around as uh, term in, in practice quite frequently, but I think specificity on what that actually means and how it can be done is really critical. We're gonna walk you through that in detail. And then, as I said, we'll have time for Q and A. So sustainability at Stanford, many of you are students here. You've seen this news. Others perhaps have been watching the news from a little bit farther away, but big news is that Stanford now has a new school, first time in 70 years, the Door School for Sustainability. A very exciting moment in, the, in Stanford's history. This new school combines academic departments across disciplines that intersect with questions and opportunities in sustainability. It also pulls together institutes that uh, pre-existed and uh, imagines a new one, this Institute for Sustainable Societies. Uh, Precourt, the Energy Institute, which is where the Sustainable Finance Initiative lives, is now part of the dual Door School as is the Woods Institute for the Environment. And then there's this new piece, which we call the Sustainability Accelerator, that is uh, designed to operate actually in, in a way very similar to the work we do at Sustainable Finance Initiative in terms of uh, being very catalytic and translational in terms of getting research uh, out in the field, identifying having problems identified in the field uh, where Stanford research and analysis can be accretive in, in developing uh, solutions and then working with partners on implementation pathways to get these solutions out into the world. I'll note the other uh, platform that we work from is the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance. That's a joint initiative of the business school and the law school. Uh, so uh, kind of in a sense, building bridges from the, the business school and the law school into this new sustainability school. Also wanna just quickly cover, to put this work, carbon accounting work in context, SFI's four research uh, areas. So this is our, our current agenda um, built on uh, work that we've done uh, in, in the past, which I'll talk about in a bit to really define these four focus areas. The first of course is carbon accounting. This is a body of work around improving the accuracy and productivity of measurement and management of emissions. Uh, Carbon markets is very much related to our carbon accounting work. And this is the investigation of, you know, what is tradable property and to whom does it belong? Uh, and how to make uh, these, these markets uh, achieve this sort of holy grail of integrity that all the various uh, initiatives that are organizing around the carbon markets are pursuing, but do that in a way with a foundation of carbon accounting. There are many legal and market questions that remain unanswered uh, in, in the world of carbon markets. Transition pathways, this is an area uh, that also intersects with the previous two, 
and that it's really important to understand what are the transition pathways in the context of net zero pledges and nationally determined commitments and how do those pathways define the saleable assets and tradable assets within carbon markets uh, and, and how to, how to um, think about these just energy transition partnerships um, and applying sort of rigor and analysis to these new uh, partnerships between countries, uh, governments and philanthropy to try and accelerate transitions in uh, emerging economies and coal dependent economies. And finally, insurance, which is a set of questions around reimagining current models and, and building innovative new forms of insurance that better manage uh, physical risk for both public and private entities, which is to say, you know, we're entering a phase uh, with increasing physical risk that is burdening states beyond imagined capacities or certainly previous capacities. And there are real open questions, you know, for example, wildfire in California of how the, the private insurance market and the public insurance markets can play together to create a, a sustainable future. All right, so now I'm gonna talk to you through kind of this current, the current state of play, which we call counting carbon. So to put things in context, I invite you to kind of sit back and listen to a story. Uh, my colleagues and I wrote this book published uh, last fall called Settling Climate Accounts, Navigating the Road to Net Zero. It considers climate accounts in the triple sense of the word. So in the narrative sense, of accounts in the technical sense of accounting and in the root of accountability to make sure net zero all adds up. And it is in this kind of narrative sense that I wanna invite you to consider uh, a story that might help ground us in where we are today and understanding the history and the past to, to inform the future. And so, you know, we start up here with the, with the carbon tax and the original multilateral, you know, UNFCCC process of a top-down uh, global negotiation to put a global price on carbon uh, and, and this thing solved, right? Well, there's a long history of, of that three decades of, of multilateral negotiations, but as we all know, we haven't stuck the landing on that one yet. And in particular, as that process really stalled out in Copenhagen in 2009, and, and sort of in between what then became a near spectacular repair in Paris in 2015, drivers of climate action shuffled um, in a, it, it beyond the, the folks who show up at these conference of parties and the multilateral negotiations. You started to see businesses, started to see investors, started to see NGOs uh, come to the forefront of climate action and start to make some corrective turns to make up for the failed progress essentially of this top-down multilateral negotiation to, to put a global price on carbon. So these turns that we outline in our book as an introduction um, to then explore the rough edges of net zero in practice, um, they're concurrent and they're imagined, but they are useful heuristics in thinking about the current moment of climate action. So the first turn is this turn to green finance it is built on the belief that climate progress could be assumed on a type of autopilot where economic growth and efficient markets propel the world on a path to low carbon transition. The optimism of green finance centered around the perception that falling prices would make it easy to build only green. You can say we arguably stuck the landing uh, for green finance on renewables, um, but, but it also revealed that the world can't buy its way through the necessary pace and scale required to decarbonize across all sectors and all geographies. And so drivers of climate action turned to risk and risk essentially inverted the lens on green finance and followed its rise by a few years. It emphasizes the problems that arise when, when green finance isn't enough. The good news is the turn to risk actually brought new institutional capacity for coordinated management of transition risk, including things like the TCFD, Task Force on Financial, uh, um, excuse me, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, and the NGFS, the Network for Green and Financial Systems, an organization of, uh, of finance ministers um, and uh, central banks. These, um, these moves actually led to, to standardization in, in global climate-related reporting and stress testing, which is, which is a good thing. But the turn to risk also quickly revealed methodological and institutional puzzles we have yet to solve. There are really four. The first is that the, the risks, the focus has been on the risks of winding down, but the 
But questions having to do with replacing these activities are still largely unexamined. This is the question really of the difference between an orderly and disorderly transition and the costs associated with each are very different. Second, models. The models that are used to understand transition risk at a useful level of granularity are more in the domain of the financial modeling community than the climate modeling community. This has posed a problem. And the, the, the last point I'll make before a point I really wanna drive home, so the penultimate point, if you will, um, both physical and transition risks are, are highly subject to strategic and political behavior. And so as a result, much of the risk in the system is currently being transferred to governments in the form of disaster relief, unemployment benefits, and other bailout schemes. And this really limits the incentives for private firms to act and limits the ability of states to respond to further stress. This gets back into the insurance work I mentioned earlier. But perhaps the greatest disadvantage of the turn to risk is how far it may depart from issues of equity and justice. So the turn to risk without attention to equity risks creating a new wave of climate redlining by limiting investment in the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. And so drivers of climate action turn to net zero. And I hope this context helps you appreciate kind of this where we are now in the climate action story and how net zero sort of began its, what, what gave way to its rise. And net zero essentially combines the themes uh, developed in both green finance and risk. And, and its appeal is driven in part by the fact that net zero essentially steers around the principal difficulties of the other two terms. It steers around the difficulties of green finance and that it slides past the challenges of systems transition that plague green finance. And, and it steers around the risk challenges and that it's, it's, em its emphasis is placed on emissions alignment. And that emissions alignment really avoids the granular and strategic challenges of downside risk. And so as our book explores, uh, net zero is, is at the risk of taking the easy road and in so doing leaves what we call four unsettled accounts, data, boundaries, timing, and obligations. We'll come back to those as this story goes on, uh, but I wanna just give you this, this context setting so we can appreciate where we are in the climate action story. So let's turn to the next slide, please. So I love this slide. Thank you, Abby. Um, so this really depicts like an incredible amount of progress in, in the, uh, the drivers of net zero should take, take real um, pride in um, and, and it marks net zero's ascendancy. So you start here in 2007 um, where Google makes their moonshot announcement, right? RE less than C in 2007, which really did feel like a moonshot. We can now say, you know, that that check done um, in, in a sense, uh, which is exciting. That's kind of the green finance uh, getting, getting a sector right. Uh, move along to 2010, the SEC actually issued a first guidance on climate uh, disclosure, uh, climate risk disclosure was not per, well adhered to or followed, but, but there was an attempt here early in, in, in 2010 for the SEC to start to, to, um, to drive disclosure of climate risk. Next drum beat, you've got this risky business project. Some of you may be familiar with this was the first risk climate risk assessment for the US economy. Uh, Hank Paulson, Tom Steyer, and, and um, Mike Bloomberg were the, the figureheads of that. And Kate Gordon, who I co-teach uh, class with uh, this quarter was really the driver, founding executive director of that and driver of that work. Then you've got Paris. Then you've got you know this, this 2018 IPCC 1.5 degree C report is really a pivot pivotal moment in this story and that it really catalyzed net zero into the lexicon and science-based action into, in, into corporate and investor decision-making. And then it's just been off to the races from there. The dominoes really fell. You've got CalPERS committing to a net zero target um, in 2019. This is early. This is really early. There's still only 16% of the global economy that's commit that's pledging net zero. And you've got a US pension there, which is, which is re remarkable in and of itself. 2020 start of pandemic, you've got Microsoft making a net negative pledge, which is remarkable in that it starts to attend to the carbon stock issue, which we'll come to. Larry Fink's writing about climate in his annual letter. Now, next thing, 2021, you've got GFANS with 450 signatories, signatories managing 130 trillion. GFANS is the global financial, excuse me, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Um, the ISSB comes together. Uh, you're now at 68% of the global economy. And here now, 2022, GFANS is up to 153 trillion. SEC's got a proposed climate rule. 
and net zero covers 91% of the global economy. It's truly remarkable when you look at this slide. Um, you've got the sort of green finance turn in here early with RE Lesson C, you've got the risk turn with, with risky business, but you, what you really see is net zero take off. Um, I wanna just pause on this moment of success because it's important and it, it, it marks the moment where there's opportunity to of continue to evolve. And, and this is where we'll spend the bulk of our conversation. So next slide, please. Uh, as, I, as I talked about in, in the story of the book, the practice of net zero has some problems. Um, and in particular, we've identified them in these broad categories of data, boundary, timing, and obligations. These headlines embody those challenges. So here, Exxon, um, you know, this question of which is more ESG-friendly, Exxon or Tesla, this is a this is ultimately comes down to a question of, of the challenge of data. You've got this is an ESG question. Um, ESG has its own challenges, even distinct from climate and carbon data. But you've got a, a self-governed heterogeneous pool of, of data sources. You've got a lot of opportunity for greenwashing, and you've got a lot of a lack of comparability and consistency in the data. There have been emerging efforts around this, but but um, when it comes to climate accounting, it's clear that what we really need are primary emissions data. On the BP headline, this is this brings up the issue of boundaries, where to draw lines up and downstream. Here, BP can just sell off one of its upstream assets and reduce its carbon emissions when in fact no emissions have changed in terms of the, of the atmosphere. So how do we ensure emissions don't disappear just by moving them out of bounds of disclosure rather than out of the atmosphere? Uh, this headline on, on offsets really embodies the unsettled account of timing. This also comes up in the Microsoft announcement, but net zero is a flow concept and carbon and climate change is a stock problem. So we've got this, you know, in this California forest uh, offsets buffer pool uh, going up in flames, you, you've got this issue of, of carbon stocks uh, that, that haven't been attended to. Um, and, and you've got new scope three emissions, excuse me, new scope one emissions in addition to the, the offsets that are no longer uh, uh, functional. Uh, you also have a question embodied here in the, in the, in the timing of uh, nature-based solutions versus technology. We know we need to preserve nature now. We also know we need to invest in technologies of the future. How do you make those decisions as, a, as an investor and as a manager of a corporate net zero pledge? And then finally, this question of, of obligations. So you've got this headline of, of U.S. banks threatening to leave uh, the GFANS, Carney's Climate Alliance is, is GFANS in this headline. Um, and, and that challenge has really come about because even, even if you get good data and even if you get the boundaries squared away and even if you have the, the timing right, you still have an ultimate question of what is one supposed to do with all of this information when the obligations are not, when, when these alliances and these pledges are voluntary. And so when it comes to actually making decisions that are expensive to a business, it's very unclear how decisions are supposed to be made. And so you're starting to see cracks in some of these alliances because rubber is meeting road and it's difficult to make decisions without obligations. So in sum, this, from this counting carbon section, I hope you've gathered that this is a moment now where we are transitioning from a voluntary regime that has met tre tremendous success. And it is in fact sort of a, a born out of this success is this opportunity and need to evolve our tools into what can be applied to compliance regimes and can be applied to really scale investment in decarbonization, particularly among corporates and banks. Uh, we, to, to, to achieve this, we, we need better underlying accounting systems. And again, this is to resolve these unsettled accounts that we explore in our book of data, boundaries, timing, and obligations. So here we are at carbon accounting. Uh, it sounds you know, like such a boring thing, <laughs> but, but as I hope you'll see uh, in the next 20 minutes, 15 minutes or so, it is really the foundation on which we can unlock so many of the barriers that practitioners, really earnest practitioners are running into as they go about implementing their net zero pledges. So next slide, please. So to get to real carbon accounting, we have to take a sober look at the tools that we have. The GHG protocol is primarily the tool used to measure carbon emissions. It has been an incredibly valuable tool in the climate action story to date. It has been what has given rise to, to net zero's ascendancy, um, but, it, but it's time to take a closer look. So the, the purpose of the protocol was as a proxy to measure risk back in the day when we, when we had that carbon tax that was coming. 
And so what were essentially features of the protocol that there were that, that that were there was double counting, but that was in a sense really a feature more than a bug, particularly from an advocacy perspective, and that it enabled advocates to tag emitters with with emissions that weren't necessarily within their control. Um, and you, the the data issues were features because you could use approximations, you could get sort of rough estimates of of direction of travel, uh, and that was fine when it was used as a proxy for risk. Um, and boundaries were flexible because you were using the, the, these numbers for internal forecasting and, and seeing how changes in strategy would affect the direction of emissions upstream and downstream. That's all very useful in terms of internal uh, management, uh, internal risk management, but where it starts to fall down is when you try and make it add up. And I invite you to look closely at the picture on the right, which I have seen so many times over the last 20 years. 20, longer than that even. Um, but it wasn't until recently where I realized that it's actually wrong. <laughs> um, because you've got arrows going up into the atmosphere for scope one, which is correct. Those are emissions that are going to the atmosphere. But scope two and scope three here where the arrows are going up in the atmosphere is, is actually not correct. It's scope two and three are other people's scope one emissions that are that are being assigned elsewhere, but they aren't additional emissions going into the atmosphere. And so here's a picture that really drives this point home. And it's a very simple supply chain. And it shows you how this kind of feature of double counting in, in the risk management world, um, or in a, as a proxy, excuse me, for risk management, um, becomes a bug. So this is a very simple three-step stainless steel supply chain to picture here. You've got a melt mill, a re-roller, and a service center. And, and essentially what you can see here is in the first, uh, on the left, um, there are only two firms involved. So the melt mill, for those of you not familiar with steel supply chains, uh, the melt mill is, is taking new and recycled metal material, uh, melting them together to form stainless steel or other forms, um, strips or bars or plates or wires. And then you've got a re-roller that's a giant machine that's re-rolling stainless steel strips to produce thinner gauges with tighter tolerances. And then you've got a service center, which is a massive storage depot used to supply production lines. So in the first image, there's only two firms involved. Um, the melt mill and the re-roller are owned by the same entity. But you can see here, it takes the 50 tons of, of emissions that are entering the atmosphere and turns it into 60 by counting the, the scope one of the service center in, this, in the melt mill and re-rollers scope three. What happens on the right is where, is where the protocol really starts to fall down in practice. Because what happens on the right is now the, the melt mill has sold off its re-roller business. And, and this three-step supply chain is now owned by three different firms. And now you've got scope three emissions that have increased 300% by just M&A activity. So you've, you've turned 50 tons of emissions entering the atmosphere into 60, into 200. Again, this was kind of a feature at one point. It is now as we're trying to compare and align ledgers above. So, here we're just going to take a little detour into into accounting um, and and talk about just tools that are fit for purpose. So again, this isn't to say that the GHG protocol doesn't have a useful um, life. It, it certainly does. It's a very useful tool for managerial accounting um, and for internal decision making and forecasting. Uh, and and the, the flexibility is a feature. These are all sort of captured on this in, on the left-hand column. But once you're into the kind of external side of things, where you're into uh, the realm of financial accounting, which is where we're heading with mandatory disclosure and with um, ex significant investment decision making, uh, we need a, a tool fit to purpose. So we need something, you know, something more like financial accounting that is useful for investor decision making, that is re reliant, that it, that is. Um, uh, demonstrable through past performance that has rigid and regulated and firm boundaries and can be subject to oversight and audit. So what is what would that tool look like? The tool looks like e-liabilities. Uh, this is work actually originally um, conceived with two faculty out of Harvard and Oxford, uh, Karthik Ramana and uh, uh, Bob Kaplan. And they, they originally published this work about, gosh, maybe nine months ago in Harvard Business Review, uh, introducing this e-liability system. And it's, it's actually very simple. It's, it's, it's activity-based. 
It's a step-by-step -step process where emissions are generated by each company and then essentially handed off down a supply chain, much like costs would be in a cost accounting or a value added tax. And, and also important to keep in mind that, that some carbon is, is, is not handed off and retained similar to inventory. So you can see that picture of this very simple supply chain where the emissions, some emissions are passed and some are retained as inventory if they aren't sold as a, as a good or a service. So what e-liabilities um, are that the GHG protocol is not for compliance is fit to purpose. And, and the reason is because they solve these accounting issues that the, that the current protocol cannot. They, they eliminate the double counting. Um, carbon is counted only once. They rely on primary data and eliminate the widespread use of estimates or industry averages. I know, you know this isn't a, flip, a switch you just can flip overnight, but what it does is create the incentives to improve that data over time and, and to drive towards sole reliance on primary data. And, and then this is huge, it solves the boundaries issues. It gets, it gets consistent and firm boundaries. Uh, so you have consistent reporting and can be audited and legally enforced. So here's where our work builds on this work out of Harvard and Oxford and e-liabilities to this concept of emissions liability management and carbon balance sheets. So once you have e-liabilities, you can start to build a carbon balance sheet and carbon balance sheets allow us to actively and accurately manage emissions liabilities. So just like a you know, accounting T-chart, you've got your debits and credits, you've got your e-liabilities. These are cumulative stocks and incremental flows of carbon emissions that, that are essentially permanent obligations. And then you've got two ways primarily to balance those e-liabilities with a corresponding asset or contra liability. One is, is investment in supply chain emissions reductions. This is happening right now. You know, there, there are companies that are particularly well, tech companies are, are setting up funds and finding ways to invest in renewables in Asia to drive down the emissions of their supply chain. Um, but this creates a, a structure and a foundation on which to make for invest for, for, for decision making with real numbers and, and a balance sheet to um, capture the activities um, and the costs and benefits. And then, of course, the other uh, uh, asset or control liability are, are offsets. Um, uh, removals are the only permanent way, you know, uh, well, uh, removal of capturing CO2 and storing it in rock is the only way to permanently uh, extinguish a liability. But you can think about offsets now as an opportunity to match duration of liabilities. So you can have, you know, going back to the California forestry example, you can have your your forests. And in fact, we need people to be investing in nature-based solutions, but you attend to them um, according to their to the duration. Uh, and so if, if those offsets are, are reversed, you've now got a new liability of the scope one emissions of those of that reversal, and you've got to replace that asset um, in your portfolio. And so it creates it, it creates a structure for incentives and decision making to balance these questions of timing of of, of natural carbon sinks and technology investment uh, and, and make those decisions efficient in terms of uh, pricing. So ELM is this, is this magical tool. Of course, there's more work to be done and there's, there's, uh, there's still questions that remain unanswered, but it, it attends to these unsettled accounts that we've identified in our book of data boundaries, timing and obligations. So again, on the data side, it delivers consistent, comparable, and reliable decision useful data with incentives for continual improvement. Data is a challenge in the current system and it will be a, ch a challenge in this system. But the point here is that in a system of ELM, when the data gets better, it will matter because it'll enable those who are making these improvements to, to, cap, to, to, um, to receive investment and, and benefit from having reduced their, their liabilities as opposed to capturing the benefits of others by using industry averages. It defines these clear and consistent boundaries that enable comparability and alignment of carbon ledgers. This is so key, right? If we're gonna make net zero add up, we've gotta be able to compare corporate, national and global carbon ledgers. We can't do that right now in a system that arbitrarily overcounts. Timing, it addresses this, this the, the really critical missing element of net zero in practice right now, which is not paying attention to stocks. Right now people are, you know, they've, they've got their targets, they're, they're, they're counting carbon in the current year and, and then going about it all over again, not, not 
paying attention to the fact that those emissions this year, that liability is, is forever. <laughs> and, and in practice and in implementation, we'll have to define time horizons that can be managed. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 years. You know, these are not out of the question. There are long-term benefit plans or, or defined benefit plans now that, that manage these intergenerational timelines. But that's the kind of timing that we're talking about. We're not talking about a, a, a you know, an emissions this year and an offset this year and, you, and you're done. And finally, and this is the most important point, obligations, a, a balance sheet, by nature of having to balance one balance sheet, you create this obligation to manage the liability permanently and to allow for the efficient allocation of company, investor, and government capital. Now we can come to this in the Q&A, how do you create the, the regulation for furnishing a carbon balance sheet? We have a playbook and we'll come back to that. And you can see here just below where e-liability sort of covers the data and boundaries questions, but it's this emissions liability management work that we've, that we've been investigating that covers the whole uh, array of unsettled accounts and together they can make net zero add up. And just to keep driving home the point, so you get, you get the, the story of the three turns, you get the unsettled accounts of data boundaries, timing and obligations, you see how this foundation of carbon accounting, it is, it is the foundation on which we can make this all add up. And it's not just making net zero add up, you, you see these, these, it's the driver for these benefits that, that have been, that are plaguing net zero in current practice. So scaling decarbonization, going from billions to trillions, getting corporates to make real, you know, to make material investments in decarbonizing their supply chain instead of having to you know, spend some money here and there and, and, and marking it as, as, um, as advertising spend for, you know, for brand enhancement, as opposed to really something that's, that's held on a balance sheet. You've got the foundation on which, you know, there's all this conversation around building integrity in the carbon markets that's focused on the quality of the supply. But what's missing in those conversations is, is market integrity and carbon balance sheet build the foundation on which we can have market integrity for carbon trading and, and um, investment in, in carbon removal and natural carbon sinks and to some extent avoided emissions, although we can get into that in the Q&A, it's a little trickier, um, ties back to the work on transition plans and what is in fact a saleable asset. And then this really important point of aligning carbon ledgers, right? We've got to make net zero add up uh, and we can't do that if we don't have, uh, if we're double counting, triple counting, and if, uh, if, if, we, if we don't have actual numbers. Um, and I would just say now, you know, this, this carbon accounting foundation, the foundation that we've, that we've got right now in the, in the current regime isn't stable enough, isn't, isn't capable with, of withstanding the, the, the pressures that, that these goals are going to put on it. It's not to say that it wasn't successful. In fact, it was hugely successful, which is how we've gotten to this moment. It's just that it's time to evolve our tools to make them fit to purpose and, uh, and, and carry the weight of this next chapter. So this is kind of the invitation for discussion, but, you know, so what's next? So great, you've got a good idea that works in theory and a few people are talking about it, but meanwhile, the rest of the world is off, you know, counting their scopes one, two, and three and about to um, furnish those for compliance in various uh, jurisdictions. You've got the SEC poised uh, on its climate rule. I will say I, I'd be shocked if scope three is in there in the final wording, um, but, you know, you've got the, the trains have left stations is the point. Um, but I, I would argue that, um, that, that ELM is, is evolutionary, not revolutionary, and that we've got, uh, we've got implementation pathways. So the first point to make is just that the, the protocol can remain a tool for managerial counting. It, it's useful for internal decision-making and for forecasting. It is useful as um, a proxy for discussion around downstream emissions. You know, as you noted, I'm sure at this point that, that ELM is a, is a cradle to gate exercise, you've still got the, the gate to grave question. Um, and that's something where the protocol can be, can be a useful tool for management and for uh, in, investor engagement. Um, and, and it doesn't conflict with this, with this evolution. It's, 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 it is an evolution. Uh, so it, it can remain. The second part point here to make is that, um, you know, we're already doing it. <laughs> Practitioners are already engaged in this cradle to great data collection. They're already asking for upstream, you know, scope three, which is essentially this upstream scope one, two, and three. And in fact, um, for scope two, 
you can think of scope two as uh, utilities e-liability. You know, they're just handing you their e-liability and we call it scope two, but call it whatever you want. It's, it's, it, that is um, actual emissions data. Now, what we need it to be is not an annual average. We need it to be delivered in smaller and smaller increments. So you're getting your actual emissions, um, you know, by the ideally by the, by the day, by the hour, by the 10 minute increment and eventually, you know, 24 seven. So, and, and finally, the point I would want to make is, is back again to the success I showed you of that timeline slide, but we've really got the playbook already. The, there, there's been so much learning and, and muscle development around this evolving, rapidly evolving industry practice. So, you know, TCFD was created in the lead up to Paris and, and implemented in less than four years, where it was this voluntary self-governed uh, group of, of industry leaders that, that, that coalesced around a set of standards. Um, that, that playbook can, can work here too. And in fact, when it comes back to this questions of how do you make carbon balance sheets um, you know, mandatory, if, if, if investors in the same way they're demanding TCFD are demanding carbon balance sheets and it becomes standard practice, it, it becomes standard practice. Um, and, and they can be then used you know, as, as, as part of a regulatory transition. And then of course the point um, that net zero adoption went from 16 to 91% in two and a half years. I mean, it's really, the appetite is there. And in the conversations we've had with practitioners, um, the, the, there's, there's strong desire to do this right. And a, and a sobering recognition that, they, that practitioners don't have the tools they need to actually get it done. And so this is, you know, we can have these net zero pledges be pretend or we can have them be real. And, and I'd like them, I'd like to live in the world where these pledges are real and we, where we have the tools to get it done. So with that, I think our next slide is questions and I'm looking forward to the discussion. No one has any questions? I hear from many students. I love hearing from students. Yeah, Daniel. Hey, Alicia, good hey, to see you. you. Doing well, I put myself on screen for the question. Um, we were debating your paper in here, it, here at Creo internally. Um, and we were a little tripped up about how well these, these liabilities could be priced. There aren't too many great examples of pricing liabilities that are beyond five or 10 years. So what capacities do you think would have to be built in order to get these priced appropriately? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and delighted to hear you were debating it internally, getting, getting wheels turning. Um, well, I mean, the, the reference asset is essentially the, you know, permanent removal in the, of, you know, sucking it out of the atmosphere and storing in rock. So that call that 500, 700, whatever the number is, it's going down. Um, but that sort of sets a market and then you can manage a portfolio of shorter duration liabilities that match, you know, your annual uh, liability. Um, and you've got the uh, incentive to invest in the, in the, technologies that are the permanent liability to drive that, you know, you develop a forward curve and you start to drive it down. So it creates, it creates, it creates the structure for the market um, to reconcile those pricing questions with the, with the permanent removal being the reference asset. Michael, I'm getting all my friends from industry, which is great to see, but I do want to see some students, but please go ahead, Michael. Hi, thank you. Super excited about this, Alicia, and working on it with you in some ways. So um, the question for me, I have is sort of related, I guess, the questions of liquidity. So I, I mean, the reason a car, I stick with things like a carbon tax is because the trend, it's really hard to move parts of the economy that are using carbon now out of using them. Like, does this, help me understand, does this system assume that all carbon is eventually buried and that's the only way to treat it as an asset? What do you do when you, how does the, how do the liabilities happen when let's say a city gets rid of all its cars and moves to hundred percent mass transit? Um, and then the other piece, of course, is the central political and policy challenge from my perspective is the transition from the fossil fuel economy to a non-fossil fuel economy and greasing the skids, ideally through a carbon tax. Right. I, I, and by the way, this is one of the few times you'll ever hear, hear me use the word tax, as many of you who work with me know. <laughs> it's not a, not a non-starter in this market. Anyway, that's, that's the question. Is that where does the liquidity come from for transition and, um, and things that just take the that get carbon out and stop it from being emitted. Right. So, I mean, core to your question is sort of the distinction of what problems can markets solve and what problems do policy, do we need policy to solve? Right. So 
e-liabilities and ELM address sort of the market actors and in aligning incentives and creating obligations for market for private sector to invest in decarbonization of their supply chains and of their products. And I should say, you know, in terms of like, it, it also defines what the hell is a net zero pledge. Well, a net zero pledge is you, you have, you're, 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 you've got a carbon balance sheet that's balanced. Now, some companies may go farther and say, you know, I'm going to have net zero product life, life cycle emissions for my product. So I'm going to, you know, I'm Apple, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm a sustainability leader. This, this, you know, iPhone might have, you know, 500 grams of carbon in its embedded, you know, that I'm going to sell it to you at zero e-liabilities, but I'm also going to take the next step and know that you use this for X number of years and you live in Palo Alto and your emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So it can define more clearly define what a net zero pledge is. But to your question about decarbonization of the transportation sector, that's, that's, poli that's in the realm of policy. We need that too, because at the end of the day, as I'm sure many of you have sort of realized in this conversation, downstream emissions are still you know, a problem. <laughs> and we've, and, and when you think about what those downstreams are, those are me turning on my lights, they're me getting in my, you know, I've got my electric vehicle, but, you know, getting on an airplane, et cetera, it's, you know, buying my clothes, wash. So that, though, that requires uh, th those downstream emissions and where consumers are sort of, are, are the problem, if you will, who pays and how to manage that are, are questions that, that mar the market isn't going to solve. We need policy. We need efficiency standards. We need um, targets. And and the question of that was also sort of embedded in in what you said is is what about carbon taxes and how do carbon taxes intersect with this? And I think that the 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 answer to that is you know right now there's the, the carbon tax is disconnected to the emissions. Um, without the carbon tax actually um, managing the liabilities the the um, implementer of the tax isn't actually man, you know it, it is 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 trying to solve one problem without attending to the to the primary problem which is how to you know how are they managing their emissions liability so if those taxes go towards investment in um, in programs that are reducing you know household emissions but are but are kept according to a carbon balance sheet then you've got a system that's actually Reconciled. Right now, we've got a system that's disconnected from the carbon. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, Alicia. It's Holly. Hi, Hi Holly. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm walking. Thank you. This was fascinating. So, um, who, in addition to you and folks at Stanford, are working on actually developing this tool? Um, and is it in collaboration with the folks at Harvard and Oxford, or? Who's developing this? And and uh, I guess you were saying not that many people know about it, but how are more people going to know about it? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. And I should say, you know, there's another colleague here, a uh, faculty member at the GSB, Stefan Reichelstein, who's been collaborating with the Harvard and, and Oxford faculty and also writing on his own. Um, they're all, by the way, accountants, which I, by the way, am not. So their work is very deep in the technical implementation as, uh, from, you know, the, the technology of accounting. Uh, our work is more translating it into practice and into this emissions liability management. But the Harvard and Oxford guys, so we're all collaborating, I'll say. Um, and the, as soon as you find people that want to talk e-liabilities, it gets very exciting and we all want to you know, hang out together. So it's a small but growing and enthusiastic group. Um, but there's now something called the e-liabilities institute that uh, is uh, the, the, the Harvard and Oxford um, faculty are, are co-founders of that, and they're actively engaged with companies, developing case studies, developing pilots. They've got a, a slick video you can watch on to go through, you know, what I said in one slide in a five minute video as far as what e-liabilities are. Um, and, and then, you know, we're going on a road show and, and talking to anyone who's willing to have the conversation. I will say there's, there is strong resistance among particularly the environmental like advocacy community to have this conversation because scope three is such a important tool for advocacy. Um, so there's, there's th 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 that has been a challenge, um, but from a practitioner perspective, it's been met with real interest and curiosity as we find way, you know, as, as, it, as, as they experiencing it, they experience it as a completely rational tonic to 
sol be the solve to all their problems. <laughs> so, but it's sort of like, yes, this makes total sense. Who's doing it and who, you know, how do we get started? And we're, we're there. And this is kind of the, also the opportunity and the challenge for the accelerator and for folks, you know, groups like SFI is how do, how do we get that flywheel going? And right now it's publishing, talking, uh, engaging with folks that'll listen and starting to try and get pilots going. Yeah, thank you. Alicia, there's a, yeah, a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, how will corporations offset liabilities today? Is there effective? Well, so, I mean, what, what's happening today is that folks are attending to their flows. Um, and so they, to the extent that they're buying offsets today, they're, they're, they're using advertising dollars or marketing spend, you know, it's not booked as an asset, um, which is, uh, which is a problem. And also I mean, a problem for a number of reasons, not the least of which it limits the amount of investment that companies are going to make. Um, and then the timeline for developing an effective offset market, I mean, I think that's, you know, everyone's antsy to, to, to get that going, but I think. We're, we're, what we're seeing is there are some fundamental questions that, that folks who are trying to get it going are asking the wrong questions. Um, that there are these more fundamental questions or should be asking, in addition to the questions they're asking, should be asking these more fundamental questions around the foundation of carbon accounting, around the definition of tradable assets as they relate to transition plans, as they relate to property rights, as they relate to, and then, and then uh, really understanding the market structures and the proxies for commodities that that can build the, the market trading mechanisms that will um, that will enable the growth of the offset market. So a, a lot of work still needs to be done. There's a lot of energy and enthusiasm around it, but I think there's a need to kind of step back and ask some more fundamental questions. Yeah, Brad. Yeah, coming off mute here. Hi, um, Brad Schaller with Windrock International. Thanks for hosting this. It's been uh, super interesting. I have um, I, I work at Windrock now, but for about ten years, I worked at WWF on science-based targets and a lot of these sorts of standards. Um, and and actually, right now, one client we have is Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative. So one of those carbon market initiatives that's trying to drive uh, kind of clarity in the market, at least on the claim side, but. Um, all of these different systems are interacting, right? So I'm sort of sort of curious, not just what maybe um, the environmental advocacy community has thought, and, and thanks for the clarification of this is evolutionary and not revolutionary, because I do think that there's gonna be, there, it makes sense that there's pushback because just seeing a transition is, is really hard, right? And so many people are working to make scope three right. And so to kind of show, a way out into something better, which I think there are people out there that are even working on scope three recognize it's imperfect, right? So I guess my question um, is how, what, like, what are the reactions of SBTI, the greenhouse gas protocol, and then regulators like the SEC and uh, the European reporting initiative, those that are in charge of that, because th those are probably the four initiatives, their views are, I would say are the most important, so. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the question and, and you know the opportunity to revisit the sensitivities around this. And I tried, and I hope to some degree succeeded in, in the presentation to to respect and honor the work that's been done and try and contextualize it because it's not it's not meant as a wholesale criticism and it's not meant to throw it all out. Um, so that said, I, I mean, my so I haven't we haven't talked to anyone directly at SBTI. I talked to you know WRI GHG protocol folks. I mean, there it's. There's very strong feelings around this, um, and 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 I get it. Like, it's hard to work in climate. It's hard to work in day in day out. It's you know you're getting the existential angst of the challenge mounting. There's the pressures from the right that are just totally irrational. And so, anything that feels like letting go of progress is very scary um, and and unappealing. And so I get that. And and so my experience in conversations with those like closest to the protocol is like, <laughs> so uh, there's, you know, kind and respectful engagement and I'm trying, but, but I would say I, I haven't had a conversation with a, where, where I feel like new information is being taken in and processed and considered and coming out. It's been a very much like, it's a feature, it's a feature, it's a feature, um, or it doesn't, it, 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 it's not perfect, but it's, the, it's all we have. Um, and I, the problem with that is, 
it, it's all we have and it's gotten this far, but it's not going to carry us to the next state. We've, we've got to figure this out and, you know, improving scope three, we can call this improving scope three, call it whatever you want it. Like, it's just sort of, it's getting the, the boundaries and the data right and, and squared. And, and that's, you know, we can get into semantics and sort of to help ease the pain of, of, of an evolution. Um, on the SEC and on uh, other regulators, it, it comes back to, to this question of who's doing it, which comes back to the playbook. Like same thing, you know, this is how we got the original, you know, uh, uh, rule in 2010 or, or guidance in 2010 that didn't go anywhere. And now we've gotten the TCFB and, and potentially real guidance because so many people were doing it. If we can get to people doing it, then the SEC is their job's easy. Then everyone's doing this, and so you should do it. Um, so that there's there's definitely the hand wringing in among the regulators of like I don't understand how we can make scope three work or make it stand up in the courts. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to an alternative, it's well, who's doing it? Yeah. <laughs> so it yeah. becomes this circular reference that we got to break out of. Yeah, I mean the thing is, is scope three is not auditable, and and everyone knows it too, and and so you know with the the voluntary carbon market integrity initiative claims guidance that came out, and this is what we're working on now, updating it. There are these um, comments, and these are public comments that people can look at the feedback received in that. It's just you know how how can we be held to account for our scope three when it's just all over the place how people are doing it, right? And very few people are using primary data and they don't want to be on the books having it as a liability, right? right. They, they don't want to use it for this purpose that you're right. talking about. So right. it's, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. It's that internal external, it's managerial accounting versus financial accounting. And especially downstream, it's always going to be an estimate. It's always going to be out of their control and it's super gameable. <laughs> so it's a good managerial tool. It's, it's tough as a compliance, you know, reporting mechanism. Appreciate the question, invite opportunity to have a longer conversation offline too, if there's a way to help on the implementation side. We're two minutes before the hour. Anyone else want to chime in before we all let you go? There's one more question in the- Oh, in the chat, yeah, sorry. There's time. Yeah, yeah good question. Um, I think, it's working with portfolio companies to begin to report their emissions uh, along, you know, in this in the in this cradle to gate e, e liabilities structure. And then what's interesting, and this is where our research is going next, is actually, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, but but the reason it, the logic follows that um, this type of accounting is going to greatly increase the cost of capital for high emitting firms. So instead of this exercise, the financial sector is going through now on on financed emissions and all the complexities involved in those calculations and the um, wide range of, of outcomes and answers one can can arrive at. This would create a very structured and, and straightforward way of evaluating um, you know, what we're calling financed emissions now, but of, of cost of capital for high emitting firms. So that's that's an area of development we, we're really excited about, both from a research perspective, but also potentially from an implementation perspective. Um, and so, you know, short answer to would like to see them doing is starting to ask companies to, you know, furnish, just like they were asking for CDP data, you know, 10 years ago, asking for, for ELM, from carbon balance sheets. Um, we do have an article. There's two articles, actually, maybe Katie can drop them in the chat. There's an impact alpha piece, which is a 10 minute talkie talkie piece. At to 10 minute read and then a 12 page working paper that, that captures all the ideas. I, this deck, which we're also happy to share, um, I think captures the story as clearly and succinctly as any of those things. But if you like to read, I do encourage you to look at those. Okay, well, thanks all for joining. I wish we could be together in person and I could see your faces, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, please do reach out if you of ideas for implementation, or if you have questions and challenges, we welcome that too.